So Simon, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly and, and kind of lead off the discussion for us? Okay. I'm Simon Eccles. I'm a journalist and I'm in the yeah. UK at the moment where it's five o'clock and it's very hot here today. I have been a writer for many years and I also was once an estimator, so hopefully I know a little bit about it. Shelby, do you want to kind of introduce yourself and give us kind of your background and then we'll go to Ken and Matt and that way we can have an understanding of everybody's background. Yeah, I'm Shelby Coda. I have previously been in the printing industry as an estimator for about nine years. So currently doing something different, but just fresh out of estimating and had the digital embellishment for five of those nine years or something close to that. Thank you very much, Shelby. Ken, how about you? Well, my name's Ken Heisinger. I very closely with Kevin and Matt. I was in the operations side of things for quite a few years. Consider myself fairly knowledgeable on embellishment, uh, sort of taught Shelby a lot of what she knows, and then she took it and ran with it. So she's the estimator extraordinaire, and hopefully I have some answers to the questions that you have. Okay. Thank you very much, Ken. Matt, how about you? Okay. Matt Redbear, and I do work with Kevin and Ken as well. And my day job is Blue Ocean Press, so I do creative design and I'm actually a machine operator for the MGI JV3DS. And I think it's important Matt's here because Matt is very often in the room when the project is being decided and quoted. So he has a very unique perspective because he helps, I think, sell a lot of the jobs on the digital embellishment press and can help talk to that. I've got a short list of questions. If anyone wants to add anything as you go along with your experience, that's fine. But the first question, and I guess we ought to go more or less in the order we've just been introduced, is do you do you handle the estimating differently for embellishment or is it just part of the, the whole job process? And I guess that also depends on whether you're doing what you're offering. If you're offering a, a full print and embellishment process or are you offering just print finishing, which, which somebody else we talked to earlier in the week was doing? Well, we did both. And so I would say... Personally, I feel like the estimating for the embellishment was completely different than what you would estimate or what we were estimating just a regular print job. So, yes. <laughs> you want me to elaborate further on that? <laughs> were you estimating using software for both the print and the embellishment? And was it, was it within the same job? It was something entirely different. So we had a print estimating software and then use kind of a Excel worksheet with built-in calculations or pricing. And you kind of filled in the blanks for microns, for the thickness, the percentage of the coverage, the color of the foils, because that varied in pricing, and the size of sheet that you're running through the press. So completely different. And it was only handled by, you know, there's five estimators and only two of the people handled the <clears throat> digital embellishment estimating just because it was a little more complex okay. right we might come back to that ken are you involved in estimating i was i had to help fine tune those factors behind the excel spreadsheet we had to take a look at what real waste was what what needed to be calculated and what didn't i, I wanted to simplify things often they try and micromanage the data that they're putting into the spreadsheet and I, and I wanted to make it simpler. I mean, if, if we're running basically 12, 18 sheets, we know the longest that our foil poles are gonna be at 18 inches. And foil is not a very expensive part of embellishment. When you break it down, you could be looking at six to 10 cents a sheet. So to, to further cut that down because you might only need foil and a half, seems sort of pointless in the big picture. So because only a couple of people seem to be able to grasp it in the estimating department, my job was to make it as easy as possible and to get into a ballpark, right? Remember, we're trying to estimate here, not, not necessarily nail it. So I was fine tuning it over time. Okay. When you're talking about material costs there, how, was labor, labor's always a, 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 a job preparation is always a big factor in estimating that, and it's different to the way printing works. So how had you set that up or what did you do about that? Well, as far as machine rate and labor itself, it was pretty standard comparatively to the other pieces of equipment we had in the shop that was 
there was no serious brain surgery behind that part. Where it did get a little bit more complicated was in coverage, because obviously varnish is a big consumable. So we often had them guess at low, medium, and high in the estimating department. And typically, I have to be honest, if we did our job right and sold the less is more approach to how embellishment is effective, we were often finding ourselves less than what we had in our spreadsheet for low. We would have a, let's just say 20% in the spreadsheet. And then we would get done with the job and look at the calculator on the MGI and often find out we were running one to 2% coverage Hmm. on some items. So there was quite a bit of profit built into the average and still came out quite affordable for most customers. How about you, Matt? Okay. Well, I'm kind of in the same ballpark with Ken. There was a, there's a lot more generalization. We do estimating as kind of a module plug into enterprise. And so they, they feed all this information in there. There's kind of low, medium, and high, a little bit, and a whole lot. You know, there's different levels, different steps of coverage, consumables, that type of thing. But it's really generalized. And when it comes to the MGI, it's usually as a completely separate line item to the total estimate, but it's considered completely separately because it's not only, it's not only the sheet size and we don't really even go by coverage. If, if they're putting on a ton of varnish or just a smattering of varnish, it's, it's the same price. It's based on passes. How many passes it goes through? What is the sheet size? Is there foil? Is there no foil? We don't even have an upcharge for holographic foil, which is, as we all know, is considerably more expensive than the staple foil like silver or gold, which they sell in such a volume that you get at a pretty good rate. But then when you get to holographic, you get to lots of dots, you get to the clear sheets, the see-through types of films. There's no upcharge. It's just, is there foil or is there not foil? Is there varnish? Is there not varnish? How big is the sheet? One of the things, one of the challenges we have is that whether or not it goes through the MGI depends on how it's finished. Just because of the nature of the varnish itself, it's got to go through the horizon smart slitter. You can't clamp it down on a polar cutter you just can't i mean you're going to smash it you're going to squash the foil you're going to ruin the job so it has to go in a sheet fed digital cutter that is going to give you really good creases and really clean cuts and not smash what you've just put on it as far as embellishment goes so there's a lot of considerations before and after for handling that create additional line items and upcharges The other thing that we're finding a roadblock to that we have to stop and think about is using uncoated stocks for creating estimates on uncoated stocks. An estimator wouldn't know how that stock is going to react to foil and varnish or that it has to go through the machine two times. You know, I've got an example. I actually did this today. I had to lay down this black type, and not all of it gets varnish or foil, but this is, you probably can't see it in this light here. It's classic Crest solar white. It's very porous paper. I mean, this stuff will soak up water like a sponge and there's no coated surface. It's considered a digital stock, so it will go through the iGen very nicely. But when you try to put foil and varnish on top of that, it not only takes on the texture of the paper, which could be desirable in some ways but if you want a smooth job like you would normally get off this machine you've got to get creative and there's no way an estimator is going to know how to do that or or software there's just I, i don't know of any way that that you could build that into an estimating software maybe there is but just to let you know what we came up with actually turned out quite quite beautiful i'm not sure how many people know who have these kinds of equipment, how to do that, by the way. A lot of yeah. people just steer clear from uncoated. I don't think a lot of them are as experimental as, as you guys at Blue Ocean Press when it comes to taking on jobs like that, but that's that's pretty yeah. cool. 
But and this is a heavier varnish. This is fifty eight plus fifty eight. It went through two times. Yeah. Lay down the varnish and then I run it back through. I lay down the varnish and then the foil on top of it. And I make sure I got my registration marks on the edge here yeah. so that the machine will read it exactly every time. And it worked out beautifully. And the only reason we do it is because the customer requests it. That's the stock they want to use. And that's the, the style of embellishment that they want on it. They, they don't want flat foil. They want raised stuff. So you Matt, know? do you think there's a lot of education that needs to go to the, to the estimators on what the limitations are of the equipment? Yeah, and, and that could be a manual or a book all in itself because different stocks are going to react different ways. It's going to react differently on an Evo than it is on a JV3DS because they use two different types of varnish, mm. two different types of, of lamps to set that, and they're going through the machines at different speeds. You've got all these variables that you wouldn't really know. So maybe maybe it would be enough to just generalize in an estimator set up that if it requires a specialty stock like that, that a live proof must be done yeah. before the estimation continues forward with the feedback from the operator on how to get it to work. I agree, and I, I think that one of the reasons that Shelby got really good at it is because she didn't take my word for it. She kept asking, well, why won't it work? So I would often give her the sample. I would show her why it wouldn't work, and that, that I think, was a valuable resource for her. She could then explain to the customer exactly why it wouldn't work, not because Ken said, because this is what it will look like and why it won't lend itself well to a good finished product. Yeah. We've gotten very accustomed to running a live proof from beginning to end here, all the way from pre-press all the way up to finishing. And just to cover our butt so that we don't get any unexpected Surprise. surprises, yeah, in, in the midst of doing the job or to get in the middle of it and find out that we can't do it. And then we have to disappoint the customer right. and cancel the job and eat the stock and the time that we spent in setting it up. So maybe there's a whole list of things that need to be developed that you create a stopping point in the estimating system. And then it, it goes to the operator or it goes to a consultant who knows, and then you get that proper experienced feedback yeah. and then decide whether or not to go with the live proof or not to actual run some and see, which is the beauty of the digital you know, process. You can just do it and then progress forward from there. And we do that with a lot of our customers. We just get to that stopping point, make then that's what we're doing with what I just showed you. Mm. Make sure it's gonna work, make sure the customer likes it. Make a sample, leave it at the front desk for them to sure. pick up, look, see, feel and hold. And then if they like it, we move forward from that point on and generate pricing. It sounds like you're obviously learning from experience, but you know, what, what then do you do about it, Shelby and Matt? For a, do you make a note, okay, this paper will work in a certain way, so in six months' time when you get it again and you've forgotten, you know, have you got notes on it, or can you enter that into the Excel spreadsheet or, or whatever you're using? Space stays in the brain. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, there were no notes, which I don't know if be a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, I think that it, typically, in my opinion, when we did something out of the box that we didn't think was going to work that did end up working, it wasn't something that I quickly forgot about. And I think that that something to what Matt said, that there's so many variables is also why we had just two designated people doing the embellishment estimating because there was too many if this, then that situations and it did have to go on a different press to cut or you know a different machine to cut and to fold and don't forget about this and it was just a lot for the estimators who you know to remember so to to, to designate a couple of people to doing that was probably the only way it was ever going to get done and estimated correctly okay. Matt, just at the beginning, you, you mentioned you used Enterprise. What did you mean by that? Is that software? No, it's it's the name of a software, and it's 
you know, think of it as your house software where you enter all the jobs, all the customer information, each job is created, all the files are uploaded into the system. It creates this whole world of where the jobs live. So we have all the jobs folders, we have all the customer information, all the data, which machines you get used, and then it generates all the statistics, time used, you enter how much time you spend on everything. You know, it's daily operating software and it has that estimating capability built into it's not specifically for embellishment. You kinda of had to work around it or it's basically for any business whatsoever, wow. and this is custom tailored for print shops. I mean both Shelby and, and Matt, you're not using off the shelf print estimating software for embellishment. You, you Shelby used Excel for that, and then you're using this sort of enterprise, so Matt. Is that because there's nothing out there, or you didn't want it, or? You know? It's what we already use, and it's just another line item, another, another section built into it where they put in another machine, another process, and then they click on that, and then it adds it to the estimate and it just adds everything together a plug-in just for embellishment that would plug into anybody's estimating system does that sound attractive i think that the software companies have been really weak in the estimating of cover of coverage the click model works in most of the software the offset side of things works well in all the software but when it comes to a percent of coverage and you're measuring consumables most of them were pretty weak at that. We found that there was no formula we could put in that was going to quite work as well. And also the complexities of the multi multiple pass, right? Most gear offset presses are one side, maybe two or one pass perfecting. Or the, the, in the case of a toner base machine, it's one duplex sheet. It comes out, it's done. When you're having to do four, five, and six passes of a product, literally all your expenses can increase by as much as six times. So then you're pulling the machine over in your estimating system as a press that's that's going to be in, listed in your estimate six times. So that doesn't bode real well to a to a simple and easy to understand estimate. Coverage is a different animal. I mean, even on the inkjet side of things, I got a feeling that the software companies are responding a little bit better now because of a wide format and ink consumption in that area. And some of some of this may may marry up. It's going to be quite helpful probably to not even the embellishment community, but to the inkjet community. Guys, I have one question because the heart of the story that we're writing is about the creation of this, this new market for the pricing of digital embellishment. So in the early days, when you guys first invested in the machine, I think a lot of people were selling it at market bearable, which is, you know, it costs this much to do a die. You know, it's $500 to do this job traditional. So I'm going to sell it for $500. And what we've seen is as more and more people got this type of technology, the pricing has kind of created its own little niche. Can you guys talk a little bit about that? If you saw the price kind of find its own home and not necessarily sell at what traditional embellishment were? Yeah, I don't think, I can't remember all the way back to the early days, but I'm sure we did some beginning pricing like that. But I think it's, you know, Get in itself, it's not comparable to a die because you can't get a die for 25 people's names. You can't do the variable that the machine can do. So, I mean, it's easy to sell it as a its own little completely different. So, yeah, you might be comparing to somebody who's buying a foil die, but this product that you're going to get from us isn't a foil die product. It's a, you know, raised foil. It could be, you could do 10 sheets if you wanted to do 10 sheets, or you can do... A thousand sheets. So your clients uh, knew they were, it was a digital process. There was no, there was no hiding that it was. You're not charging for for the same setup fees as a traditional. The clients knew you were doing this on a digital machine. We made yeah, we made sure they knew it was a digital press just yeah, because right. it was so unique. Tell them a little bit about one of the casinos that you were able to have some success with, and as far as pricing and how you helped them to understand the benefits of going that direction, embellished direction. Yeah, so as we all know, casinos make money and they like to spend the money too, especially those VIP events to get those high spenders. So those were literally perfect jobs because there were never more than, you know, a couple of thousand, if that. And they always wanted to go all out, do the fancy foil, hol holographic foil was their favorite. They had jobs that had like 
six passes, you know, three on one side, three on the other, digital variable names and variable numbering and stuff like that. So they truly used the product like exactly how we wanted them to use, maybe even a little bit more than what we wanted just because it got a little complicated with keeping the variable data all in line going through six times and then getting cut and scored and pulled it. It it got a little crazy sometimes, but um, yeah, they, they really understood. I mean, we had to help them understand because at first they were like, cover this whole picture in varnish. That's what we want. And I'm like, that's not really the best use of this technology. You know, it's not to put a block of, of UV on it. It's, you can do that. And so we, we did a lot of, um, what they would send me is their artwork even if it was just in like the beginning stages and they'd say what do you think would look best we want we're thinking foil and uv for this project so i would go to ken and say what do you think about you know i was thinking this this and this and i would go get in our pre-press people too and so they kind of gave us once they kind of understood that they weren't what they were asking for wasn't gonna make it look amazing or worth the money that they were gonna put into it they kind of started trusting us to just say, okay, look, we're going to do foil on these areas, UV on these areas, and it'll look amazing. And they kind of just mm. let us run with it. Oh, great example. Were you then going and working with their designers and saying, well, this is how you set it up and this is how you do layers in Photoshop or whatever they were doing to create the uh, embellishment layers? Or, or is this a search no. you needed to, to add to the what they, what they said they wanted to do and you made it work? Yeah, we really just made it work. We never really, I don't know if it's because we didn't take the time to train the clients or it just is an extra complex layer, but we really did a lot. Actually, all of the back end worked. We would ask for people's native files, you know, complete PDFs and all the native files so that we could do all the work to it, add the layers that we needed. And I think it worked out better because then we didn't have to fix people's files that they thought they were making correct because a lot of times they weren't doing it the right way anyways. So we really did the work. And honestly, now that I'm like saying it out loud, it probably it was mm. the right path to go. So we didn't have two times the work to <laughs> undo what they did and do what it needed to be done. On well, the other other element there was they were casinos were great for getting us artwork at the last second. So we didn't have a whole lot of time to go back and forth. We knew their deadline wasn't going to change because we could see when the event was on the artwork that they sent. So as much as we wanted to go back and teach them the right way to do it, they were just constantly up against the gun. So that was a pain point we could help them with. And I think it had also endeared not only a more expensive product to the company we work for, but also to them because it made them look, look, look good within their own organization. What then did they do for visualization or proofing? Were, were you sending them digital proofs off the jet varnish because you can do one or two, or did they just look at the screen and say, "Okay, that bit of uh, you know purple or whatever is going to be metallic"? <laughs> did, did, did they have to imagine, or did you actually show them anything? Yeah, I mean, ninety percent of the time it was like we needed to turn this project that had six passes around in three days like from start to finish there was no time for proofs other than pdf proofs and just saying anything in magenta is going to be foil and or uv there were a few events like their new year's eve they're very special like they wanted to go all out for these events that they would send us some preliminary artwork ahead of time and we would give it to them but they they just trusted that we would do what was best and that it would look good and it always came out good so <laughs> i think it was so much better than any other printer could do that when they got the finished product rarely were they ever disappointed there was always some bling or some extra touch to it that set it apart from everything else so uh, some of it is trust but just some of it is the end product is freaking awesome <laughs> but as a, a general rule like the casino was an exception I think we tried to do physical proofs for anything that had UV or foil on it just because not everybody really fully understood what it was going to look like. And it kind of, even if somebody was on the fence, it kind of sold the job um, by itself if they were able to like grab their piece and touch it and feel it and be like, wow, this looks amazing. Mm. So, and I I would say for for that kind of stuff, it would be the safest to do proofs. (laughs) 
yep. physical proofs. Okay. And that's one of the beauty of digital embellishment in that you're not committing yourself, like making a die and the, the customer thinks, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> At least they can change the artwork before the, before the final job. Exactly. If you had one magic wand when it came to the embellishment system, what would you do? Like if you had the magic wand, you had one wish, what would your recommendation be? It's easy for me. I would say and I see a standard estimating system and a three-dimensional ability to view proofs online. I think those are two huge ones. Yeah, that proof, to be able to do a proof online where they could, you know, kind of turn it and see that it would mm. have a raised effect here. That would have solved a lot of kind of pain points that sure. we experienced. Yeah. And making the estimating easier would have saved my own personal <laughs> pain points. Well, three packaging previewing systems, there's ESCO and there's one called IC3D that both cost considerable amount. You're really talking a thousand dollars a month or something like that. You know, they, they will preview foils on packaging and all the really fancy effects that the packaging guys are using. So it, it, it does exist, but in companies like yours, is that the sort of price you think it's worth paying just so the customers can see the fruits? Because, you know, as I say, it, it's $12,000 a year. <clears throat> Plus, I think with the ESCO system, you've got to have an ESCO system, repress system there as well. Yeah, if you're asking if that's too much, yeah, that's way too much. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's, it's exactly what you think it is. <laughs> Printing out a physical proof. Cheaper. Job yeah. would have been <laughs> that's <printed>. a good point. <laughs> yeah, and that's why we did, we did that for a lot of customers. And, and it, it, it was just it, a total live proof job from beginning to end, all the way up to the table cutters and, you know, finishers and all that stuff. Because our clients, our a lot of our clients wouldn't have done well with the visualizer because they want exactly the way they want it. If you had a magic wand for your estimation, what would it be? I don't mm. know that I have one. Uh, I just need to know that I can run it the right. way that it needs to be run based on what the customer requires. I honestly don't okay. think I have any magic wand. I just think it's imp important to get to know your customer too. If they're not willing to pay $100 for a, a proof, a hard, a hard proof, they're probably not going to want to pay for an embellished job. So it's important to get to know your customer and find out what kind of budget they have, because if, that, if that's holding them up, they're probably not going to be a long-term embellished customer. I mean, that, that's great for as long as embellishment is a, a selling point that nobody else has got. But how long do you think you'll be able to charge a premium for, for embellishment? I think you'll always be able to charge a premium for it. The, even if you're, even if somebody comes into your market as competition, there's going to be a higher machine cost for them now than you may have gambled on four or five years ago. So if anything, it's probably going to increase in value than decrease. And I think we're looking at at least, at least five years down the road before there's so much competition that the price gets driven down. And we, we also, perhaps one last question, then I'll let you go. Just going back to what Shelby was saying about making the customer's artwork work for the casino. So, you know, helping the customers in the casinos to make sure their artwork worked and is going to output hopefully first time correctly. Is that a common thing or are you getting artwork coming in that works more or less first time with a bit of tweaking? And how do you cost or estimate for that? We always assumed that nobody was going to send in their artwork correctly, which was 99.9% .9 true. <laughs> but we did have a graphic graphic design, like pre-press charge built in to any job that we did for embellishment. We call it file intervention, but yeah, we just made sure like we that. got it. In <laughs> yeah, same here. We have a we have a line item for you know pre-press setup and you know that's going to include you know 15 minutes of pre-press time so if you can deal with it and work with it within that amount of time otherwise we give the the customer the opportunity to fix it which as Shelby notes 99 percent of the time probably 99.9 .9 percent of the time they're not going to know how to fix it or they're not going to be able to fix it correctly so we 
basically give them the opportunity. They'll try to fix it. They won't fix it. Then we offer to fix it for an additional line charge. Mm -hmm. And then they'll hand it off to me. I'll let them know how long it took, even if it took four hours. You know, we had four hours of, of design time because I, I'll tell you, I've had to take like 28 page documents and stripped them all apart and ripped all those pages to pieces and reassemble everything. And that takes a lot of time to put that back together in layers because we have to output basically two separate files, one for the digital print and one for the MGI. Is there a way of educating the designers, the creatives to get it right first time, or is it just easier to fix it? Oh, they, they need to sit in a, a classroom for a week or two and go through this intensive because there's a lot to it. And if you've never worked in pre-press for a year at least, like, like, deep in the trenches, you're getting yeah. files from everybody and every for, for every machine and every type of output. And you'll see every mistake and every problem and you have to fix everything. So it's that level of intensity that, you know, a lot of, they don't, a lot of people don't even know how to do a spot color separation. They're just so used to RGB on the internet or CMYK for print. So going beyond that, you know, requires a, a quite a bit of education. Call Tactiful. <laughs> we offer that as a service, and Matt is actually one of our instructors on how to do that. So that's a, that's a service that Matt uh, is actually offering for designers right now. All right, guys. Well, listen, I wanted to thank all of you, Shelby, Ken, Matt, and Simon, for your time today. I thought this was really helpful, and I wanted to thank everybody for a really wonderful discussion. I, I learned a lot. 